I love strength training and I'm not the biggest fan of cardio. I don't really enjoy running. It's so incredibly clear if you only do one of those modes, strength training or endurance, you're leaving a lot of health on the table. Well, what is like a minimal effective routine then that doesn't require one to be a professional athlete and dedicate all of their free time to exercise? Like, is it important to differentiate between the different exercise modalities? And, th and th this is my answer would have been yes. And here's the reason why. At least differentiating between strength and cardiovascular endurance is critically important because they're independent predictors. They will stack on top of each other, but they're also independent. We also have so much data from lifelong exercisers. Um, this is some work I've done and published. Um, colleagues of mine have done this. There's a paper that came out just in the last couple of weeks that showed this. But it's so incredibly clear if you only do one of those modes, strength training, or endurance, you're leaving a lot of health on the table. Hmm. And so this is why I would make that argument. You really do need to have both of them. They're independent. Um, they are helping you stay alive for different reasons. We have the direct evidence of these lifelong exercisers that they're just not in the best place if they don't do both. I love strength training and uh, I'm not the biggest fan of cardio. I don't really enjoy running. Is vigorous walking? a sufficient replacement. No. no, it's not. It's better than nothing. Again, if we're talking about what is least bad versus optimal. Um, so I don't want you to hear that and think, all right, that's it. I'm out. Like I'm done, <laughs> right? It's not an excuse to not do it. Um, if, if vigorous walking is all you can get into, that's great. Um, that's like what some people refer to as zone two. Yeah. I don't care what zone like you're in okay. at all. Um, that's like a very little concern hmm. to me generally. I think it's clear that you need to be doing something that requires you to sustain energy output at a higher than resting rate for long periods of time. Okay, define that as zone whatever you want. I don't really care. Again, I have friends that are like so deep into zone two. They've made careers out of this. Amazing, like that's great. You wanna pull your blood and figure out what your lactate levels are, that's amazing. I don't really care. Um, I have other ways we pay attention to that, but that's fine. You need to clearly be able to sustain exercise or energy output that's elevated for a long period of time. What might that look like? I mean, are you jogging, bike riding, sure. hiking? It could be a vigorous walk any of those things. I think what's important to understand here is it's not the mode of exercise that matters. It rarely is, right? It's a physiological demand. So what you need to be doing is asking for an advanced cardiovascular rate that is sustained with no break. That's all we're after. The mode and method you pick is entirely up to you on the surface. It's irrelevant to this aspect of physiology. It's very relevant to other parts, joint health or movement patterns, personal preference, uh, availability to stuff, fine. But right now for this physiological output, we just simply care about asking a sustained input. Unless you're an athlete or have a specific muscle you wanna work at for uh, injury prevention or recovery or for or if you're an aesthetic sport, exercise is not really about the output. It's the input that matters, right? It's what's the physiological demand. The easy way to think about this is um, the physiological limiter will be the place of adaptation. So what I mean by that is wherever in your physiology is asked to fail, is going to be the place that adapts. Mm. So in this particular case, if you're saying, hey, we're struggling to maintain a 25% increase in output of exercise, of energy, and we're struggling to maintain that, wherever part of your physiology is struggling is going to adapt. So maybe that's your breathing. Maybe that's the mechanics of your posture. Maybe that has nothing to do with that and it is your ability to bring in utilized fat as a fuel. Maybe it has nothing to do with that and it is your gait and how you're walking and that's why your knee is hurting. That's why you're like, it could be any number of things. So that's, if it is a situation where you're like, man, every time I walk or jog lightly, I get these back injuries, then don't do that anymore. It's not worth it, right? Find another way to ask for cardiovascular demand. Find a way that is not leading to injury. If you care to fix your running, great. If you don't, then don't, don't worry about it, right? Like whatever is in for you. The same thing with our athletes that have short demands on performance, right? So if we have a competition six weeks from now, it's the same thing. This is still an investment in six weeks from now, right? We're going to be needing to do this for a lot of reasons. Outside of that, you clearly need to be able to perform at a high heart rate as well. This can be done in any number of ways. Short, high intensity intervals, like think your classic 20, 30, 40 seconds, maybe up to a minute of hard work some sort of matched recovery. Maybe this is less recovery than work. So maybe this is 60 seconds of hard work and 30 seconds of rest. Maybe it's the opposite, 30 seconds of work, more rest. They're, fun, they're different. They gives you a little bit of fun stuff. I actually think people should do like a combination of these. Hmm. Maybe it's a little bit longer, two or three minutes of sustained work, two or three minutes of rest, like fine. 
you're challenging your ability to go to a max or near max heart rate. That is going to ask different physiological demands than the lower intensity stuff. So by leaving that stuff out of the equation, you are leaving adaptations out of the equation. Just like by only going red line, only going high heart rate, max heart rate, and not doing anything at a moderate or lower is also leaving things off the table. Hmm. So I really think you need both. It's, it's hard to come up with a situation in which both of them combined at some point are not advantageous. Hmm. Well, what is like a minimal effective routine then that doesn't require one to be a professional athlete and dedicate all of their free time to exercise to achieve to achieve these these adaptations? Minimum effective dose is a little bit different because you need to think about, are we talking maintenance of current status or are we talking about actual improvement, right? So maintenance of current status, it is insanely low. Uh, if you were to do say one strength training workout every two weeks or so, that's probably sufficient to maintain muscle size and strength. Interesting. It can be very, very low. You're talking about even a few sets total over a couple of weeks. Um, there's actually a good amount of research on that, that you can sustain decent amount of strength. Can you optimize and increase? Probably not. Cardiovascular output would be the same. Actually, it, this is actually kind of fun. If you look at speed to strength to endurance and then muscle mass, is a very clear progression or, or reduction of these over time such that speed is hard to maintain. Uh, if you really want to maximize power output, this will fall off fast. It will fall off fast with detraining and it'll fall off fast with age. So if you were to plot world records and things like the marathon, compare those to world records in strength-based sports, like powerlifting, and you compare that to world records in sprinting, and you look at what happens to those world records as we go from age 30 to 35 to 40, kind of in five-year increments, the speed ones will drop off the reservation. Like they're just gone really hmm. fast. You will not see somebody who is a competitive world sprinter at 45. Hmm. You can absolutely see a competitive endurance athlete. In fact, many of the world records won't happen until folks are 30, 35 or so years old. Wow. And that the, the difference between the world record of a 50-year-old versus a 35-year-old, it's like not much. But if you look at that in 100 meter dash, it's like the difference between 9.58 and, and like 12 seconds. Like wow. it's, it's like a, just a, it's not even in the stratosphere of competitive. So speed will go off fast, strength will go off fast, but maintaining hypertrophy and maintaining endurance is really, really simple. We actually did a, a study years ago uh, looking at taper in cross country runners. So this is really cool. These were college competitive, college cross country runners. And we did biopsies of them. Uh, we did VO2 max testing. We did an actual uh, competition and we looked at them pre and post three weeks of taper. Now over the course of that taper, they end up reducing running volume by 50%. VO2 max didn't go anywhere. Stayed the exact same, right? No change. Uh, we looked at a number of markers in muscle tissue of aerobic capacity. Um, none of those moved, no reduction whatsoever. We saw an improvement of performance though. They ran faster in the post race than they did. So we lost no cardiovascular markers whatsoever up and down. We looked, again, we looked at them all over the place. We did though see a dramatic increase in the size. And I think it was about nine or so percent of the fast switch muscle fibers. So we saw a large increase in fast switch muscle fiber size with three weeks of reduced training. Hmm. They cut their training in half and saw it. And they were terrified by the way. Wow. Because like, like endurance runners, like you take mileage away and they're like, they yeah. get really, but we saw nothing. So the point, the grand point I'm making there is, is endurance is fairly stable, very minimal doses. If you were to do one, again, I don't know the, an exact paper here, um, but if you were to do one session, say 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, maybe four of those, right? So repeat that four times. You did that once every couple of weeks, I would imagine it would probably keep your VO2 max reasonably close. Click the link in our bio to get instant and free access to our Hypertrophy Highlights Fireside Chat, which is Dan and I discussing really personal aspects of how we go about programming for muscle hypertrophy. In that chat, you're going to hear Dan and I talk about our own experiences working with clients who are trying to add muscle mass. And especially, you're going to hear us tell some stories that you've never heard us talk about in any podcast ever before. This is not something you're going to want to miss.